Good morning, everyone. So, continuing with the theme for the winter retreat, Dhamma Nupasana Satipatthana, the fourth foundation of mindfulness. And now we're moving on to the uh, section on the six sense bases. <coughs> and before we dive into that, I thought just a reminder of the overview, we read that this excerpt from Satipatthana Sutta, Majjhima 10. And how does a bhikkhu abide contemplating dhammas as dhammas? Here, a bhikkhu abides contemplating dhammas as dhammas in terms of the five hindrances, in terms of the five khandhas, in terms of the six sense bases, in terms of the seven factors of enlightenment, in terms of the four noble truths. So these various... Uh, teachings that the Buddha has offered us. So it's the six sense bases, or uh, various translations. Ajahn Tanisro calls it the six sense media. And I'll be reading various, various of his translations from the Samyutta Nikaya. In the first, uh, is Samyutta Nikaya 35-95. To Malankya Puta. Then Varamo Malankya Puta, who was ardent and resolute, went to the Blessed One and, on arrival, having bowed down to him, sat to one side. As he was sitting there to the Blessed One, he said, It would be good, Lord, if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma in brief, so that having heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One, I might dwell alone in seclusion, heedful, ardent, and resolute. Hear now, Malakya Puta, what will I say to the young monks when you, aged, old, elderly, along in years, come to the last stage of life, ask for an ad- admonition in brief? Lord, even though I'm aged, old, elderly, along in years, Come to the last stage of life. May the Blessed One teach me the Dhamma in brief. May the One well gone teach me the Dhamma in brief. It may well be that I'll understand the Blessed One's words. It may well be that I'll become an heir to the Blessed One's words. What do you think, Malankya Puta? The forms cognizable via the eye that are unseen by you, that you have never before seen, that you don't see, that are not to be seen by you, Do you have any desire or passion or love there? No, Lord. The sounds cognizable via the ear. The aromas cognizable via the nose. The flavors cognizable via the tongue. The tactile sensations cognizable via the body. The ideas cognizable via the intellect that are uncognized by you, that that you have never cognized before, that you don't cognize, and that are not to be cognized by you. Do you have any desire or passion or love there? No, Lord. Then Malankyaputta, with regard to phenomena to be seen, heard, sensed, or cognized. In reference to the seen, there will be only the seen. In reference to the heard, only the heard. In reference to the sensed, only the sensed. In reference to the cognized, only the cognized. That is how you should train yourself. When for you there will be only the seen in reference to the seen, only the heard in reference to the heard, only the sensed in reference to the sensed, only the cognized in reference to the cognized, then Malankya Puta, there is no you in connection with that. When there is no you in connection with that, there is no you there. When there is no you there, you are neither here nor yonder, nor between the two. This, just this, is the end of stress. I understand in detail, Lord, the meaning of what the Blessed One has said in brief. And in the verses, seeing a form, mindfulness lapsed. Attending to the theme of endearing, impassioned in mind, one feels and remains fastened on it. One's feelings, born of the form, grow numerous. Greed and annoyance injure one's mind. Thus amassing stress, one is said to be far from unbinding. Hearing a sound, smelling an aroma, tasting a flavor, touching a tactile sensation, 
knowing an idea, mindfulness lapsed, attending to the theme of endearing, impassioned in mind, one feels and remains fastened on it. One's feelings, born of the idea, grow numerous. Greed and annoyance injure one's mind. Thus, amassing stress, one is said to be far from unbinding. Not impassioned with forms, seeing a form with mindfulness firm, dispassioned in mind, one knows and does not remain fastened on it. While one is seeing a form and even experiencing feeling, it falls away and does not accumulate. Thus one fares mindfully. Thus not amassing stress, one is said to be in the presence of unbinding. Not impassioned with sounds, not impassioned with aromas, not impassioned with flavors, not impassioned with tactile sensations, not impassioned with ideas, knowing an idea with mindfulness firm, dispassioned in mind, one knows and does not remain fastened on it. While one is knowing an idea and even experiencing feeling, it falls away and does not accumulate. Thus one fares mindfully. Thus not amassing stress, one is said to be in the presence of unbinding. It's in this way, Lord, that I understand in detail the meaning of what the Blessed One said in brief. Good, Melanchia Pruta, very good. It's good that you understand in detail this way the meaning of what I said in brief. The Buddha then repeats the verses. It's in this way, Malankya Pruta, that the meaning of what I said in brief should be regarded in detail. Then Venerable Malankya Pruta, having been admonished by the admonishment from the Blessed One, got up from his seat and bowed down to the Blessed One, circled around him, keeping the Blessed One to his right side and left. Then drawing alone, secluded, heedful, ardent and resolute, he in no long time entered and remained in the supreme goal of the holy life, for which clansmen rightly go forth from home into homelessness, directly knowing it and realizing it for himself in the here and now. He knew birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task done, there is nothing further for the sake of this world. And thus Venerable Malankya Puta became another one of the Arhats. Possibly ask a question. Yes. Um, I, I've uh, read uh, Buddha Buddha's Asa at one point. He seemed to be insinuating that once uh, one cognizes, uh, one can co- cognize that have a sense contact, and that one can interrupt. The, the link in the chain between the contact and feeling, and, and actually not have feeling, and uh, um, and he was kind of putting forth that notion that that was a place to to uh, to do work where you, a feeling doesn't arise. I didn't think that was possible, but but once you have cognition of the sense contact, that some kind of feeling will come. Um, which one arises? That one feeling. That's a it, it, straight out of the sutta. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that uh, but uh, uh, you have to kind of remember that uh, I think Buddha Dasa was that he was very content to to uh, kind of pull uh, holes in, in and like, uh, or provoke. Uh, so he was uh, he was very knowledgeable of the sutta. Uh, but he was quite happy to uh, create a <laughs> It's sort of like uh, in in the business world, sort of like any kind of advertising for that. <laughs> because it's usually the junction that between feeling and craving that we're told yeah. is the is the yeah. Point of approach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, that the feeling is there, but but, but the, the reality is 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 that it you know it doesn't hurt to draw attention to contact and feeling so that you can really understand because we're usually behind the whole process. So if you make an effort to get a little bit ahead of the process, you might <coughs> gain the 
system of it. <coughs> Any other questions at this point? Or reflections, comments? Just a neutral feeling, it's feeling tone too. So even if I feel like, well, I caught the contact, it's like that's still a neutral. Yeah. 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 Sanyutin Kaya 35, 198, the chariot. And something this sutta points out is that the uh, Indriya Sangwar or sense restraint is um, part of a, a broader context. In this sutta, it's the uh, part he mentioned, uh, the Buddha mentioned it, part of the Apanaka Dhammas, uh, Indriya Sangwar, sense restraint or sense composure, moderation in eating, and devotion to wakefulness. Endowed with three qualities, a monk dwells full of happiness, of joy in the here and now, and has initiated a source for the ending of the affluence. Which three? He is one who guards the doors to his sense faculties, knows moderation in eating, and is devoted to wakefulness. And how is a monk one who guards the doors to his sense faculties? There is the case where a monk, on seeing a form with the eye, does not grasp at any theme or variations by which, if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the eye, evil unskillful qualities such as greed or distress might assail him. He practices with restraint. He guards the faculty of the eye. He achieves restraint with regard to the faculty of the eye. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an aroma with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tactile sensation with the body, on cognizing an idea with the intellect, he does not grasp at any theme or variations by which, if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the intellect, evil unskillful qualities such as greed or distress might assail him. He practices with restraint. He guards the faculty of the intellect. He achieves restraint with regard to the faculty of the intellect. Suppose there were a chariot on level ground at four crossroads, harnessed to thoroughbreds, waiting with lips, whips lying ready, so that a dexterous driver, a trainer of capable horses, might mount and taking the reins with his left hand and the whip with his right, drive out and back to whatever place and by whichever road he liked. In the same way, the monk trains for the protection of these six senses, for their restraint, for their taming, for their stilling, this is how a monk is one who guards the door to his sense faculties. And how is a monk one who knows moderation in eating? There is the case where a monk, considering it appropriately, takes his food not playfully, not for intoxication, nor for putting on bulk, nor for beautification, but simply for the survival and continuance of this body, for ending its afflictions, for the support of the holy life, thinking, I will destroy old feelings of hunger, and not create new feelings from overeating. Thus I will maintain myself, be blameless, and live in comfort. Just as a person anoints a wound simply for its healing, or greases an axle simply for the sake of carrying a load, in the same way a monk, considering it appropriately, takes his food, not playfully, nor for intoxication, nor for putting on bulk, nor for beautification, 
but simply for the survival and continuance of this body, for ending its afflictions, for the support of the holy life, thinking, I will destroy old feelings of hunger and not create new feelings from overeating. Thus I will maintain myself, be blameless, and live in comfort. This is how a monk is one who knows moderation in eating. And how is a monk one who is devoted to wakefulness? There is a case where a monk, during the day, sing and pacing back and forth, cleanses his mind of any qualities that would hold the mind in check. During the first watch of the night, dusk to, to 10 p.m., sing and pacing back and forth, he cleanses his mind of any qualities that would hold the mind in check. During the second watch of the night, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., reclining on his right side, he takes up the lion's posture, one foot placed on top of the other, mindful alert, with his mind set on getting up, either as soon as he awakens or at a particular time. During the last watch of the night, sing and pacing back and forth, he cleanses his mind of any qualities that would hold the mind in check. Mm -hmm. That this is how a monk is one who is devoted to wakefulness. Endowed with these three qualities, a monk dwells full of happiness and joy in the here and now, and has initiated a source for the ending of the effluence. Yeah, just the, the um, differences between the, did you finish that? Just yeah. the differences between the, our meal chant and the, the, it's sometimes nice to, to actually read this uh, explanation, Paul, because of the chant that we chanted the meal is uh, a little bit different. So, so that I may continue to live blamelessly and at ease. And well, then, I mean, it's just a different translation. Yeah, but I really appreciate the difference because it's, uh, I will, not create new, I will not, what is it, I will not create, new feelings. I will destroy old feelings while okay. trying not to create new feelings. From a reading, yeah. yeah. Which is quite a, a nice thing to contemplate because your the intention of your eating the food is to allay hunger, which is there, but then we often create feelings of, like, we translate as blame and being at ease, uh, blamelessly, so those are the opposite, or those are the not creating new feelings of blame or guilt and uh, and not living at ease because you're burdening your stomach uh, or old feelings of like you think about greed uh, destroying you know and then new feelings of kind of like being being full you know being kind of infatuated with with uh, having eaten and stuff like that it's just that I just appreciate the the, the two different translations and in, in using them and then the beginning of it is slightly, there's another part that's quite different as well. Yeah, it's an interesting, he makes an interesting analogy. Buddha says, just, he compares eating to, just as a person anoints a wound simply for its healing, or greases an axle simply for the sake of carrying a load. In the same way, a monk, considering appropriately, takes his food, not playfully, not, nor for intoxication, nor for putting on bulk, nor for beautification, but simply for the survival and continuance of this body, for ending its afflictions, for the support of the holy life thinking, I will destroy old feelings of hunger and not create new feelings from overeating. Thus I will maintain myself, be blameless, and live in comfort. And the, the, other, the other part about fattening, uh, we say, I haven't personally appreciated that because I don't think people mostly think about fattening, bulking up or something, sometimes feel like they want eat this food and I get muscular and healthy and I get like ripped. Mm-hmm. It'll look good, get my protein, get my, you know, but I don't know if we usually think about fattening, but it doesn't really work to say, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's bulking up. That's a, yeah, many, many decades ago, you know, if you were fat, then you were trapped. You were attractive. Yeah. You were, it was a sign that you were healthy. You were actually not just healthy, but you were well. Yeah, that was a Victorian, Victorian age. Was, it's very good. Yeah. <coughs> there are all the paintings in the Victorian age. Uh, I mean, uh, not all, but many of them are, are of naked fat people. <laughs> 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 I but I just identify with the booking up, the kind of sometimes thinking of food in that way, and, and it's good to 
to recognize that we say fatten, which doesn't always make sense, but bulking up makes a lot more sense like, to look good and get muscular and fit. Any other questions or reflections, comments? I'm wondering about the wakefulness, the Pali for what Chinese says wakefulness and there's other places that that's uh Kama Sutras that would be popular in this reference. Oh yeah, was it uh Jaya Sam Jaya Yoga. Jaya. Jaya. Uh, I can't I can't repeat it, so <laughs> <laughs> sentence, not something about attending. And how is a monk, one who guards the door to his sense faculties, though the faithful monk, on seeing a form with the eye, does not grasp at any theme or variations? Theme or variations, yeah. Is that like attending to the beautiful or the not beautiful or that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I would think that's um, attending. Another translation, I think, for signs and features. Signs and features. Much better by getting caught up in the details mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Particularly to those things that provoke lust or or actually ill will as well. Just like I think Bhikkhu Bodhi when he translated this is yeah, one is the I can't remember which one, one is the general idea of the picture of the whole the round so you're getting attracted to kind of the, the whole picture. And then the other is you're getting attracted to the the specifics. And either one you have to be very careful of. Um, or repulsed by as well, so it's the same it's the mm-hmm. way that the mind's going in an unwholesome direction. You might be like angry at somebody or something like that, so you're not giving signs of the <coughs> general picture of them and then understanding from the behaviors or the causes and conditions. Hanging to Kaya 47 6, the hawk. It has some nice imagery here, nice uh, little story. Once a hawk suddenly swooped down on a quail and seized it. Then the quail, as it was being carried off by the hawk, lamented, Oh, just my bad luck and lack of merit that I was wandering out of my proper range and into the territory of others. If only I had kept to my proper range today, to my own ancestral territory, this hawk would have been no match for me in battle. But what is your proper range, the hawk asked. What is your own ancestral territory? A newly plowed field with clumps of earth all turned up. So the hawk, without bragging about its own strength, Without, without mentioning its own strength, let go of the quail. Go quail, but even when you have gone there, you won't escape me. 
Then the quail, having gone to a newly plowed field with clumps of earth all turned up, and climbing up on top of a large clump of earth, stood taunting the hawk. Now come and get me, you hawk. Now come and get me, you hawk. So the hawk, without bragging about its own strength, without mentioning its own strength, folded its two wings and suddenly swooped down toward the quail. When the quail knew, the hawk is coming at me full speed, it slipped behind the clump of earth, and right there the hawk shattered its own breast. This is what happens to anyone who wanders into what is not his proper range and is the territory of others. For this reason, you should not wander into what is not your proper range and is the territory of others. And one who wanders into what is not his proper range and is the territory of others, Mara gains an opening, Mara gains a foothold. And what for a monk is not his proper range and is the territory of others? The five strings of sensuality, which five forms cognizable by the eye, agreeable, pleasing, charming, endearing, enticing, linked with sensual desire. Sounds cognizable by the ear, aromas cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tactile sensations cognizable by the body, agreeable, pleasing, charming, endearing, enticing, linked with sensual desire. These for a monk are not his proper range and are the territory of others. Wander monks in what is your, is your proper range, your own ancestral territory. In one who wanders in what is his proper range, his own ancestral territory, Mara gains no opening, Mara gains no foothold. In what for a monk is his proper range, his own ancestral territory, the four establishings of mindfulness. Which four? There is the case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. He, mo he remains focused on feelings in and of themselves, mind in and of itself, mental qualities in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. This, for a monk, is his proper range, his own ancestral territory. Any questions, comments, reflections? Correct. My, that, did they include the mind? He yeah. didn't. He did not. Yeah. It's just interesting in that mm -hmm. Well, one is just as many different five strands or something. Five chords. So it's just because the mind is involved in all because it is because it is. Sangha Kaya 47, 7, the monkey. There are in the Himalayas, the king of mountains, difficult, uneven areas where neither monkeys nor human beings wander. There are difficult, uneven areas where monkeys wander, but not human beings. There are level stretches of land, delightful, where both monkeys and human beings wander. In such spots, Hunters set a tar trap in the monkey's tracks in order to catch some monkeys. Those monks who are not foolish or careless by nature, oh, oh, excuse me, <laughs> those monkeys, <laughs> those monkeys who are not foolish or careless by nature when they see the tar trap will keep their distance. But any monkey who is foolish and careless by nature comes up to the tar trap and grabs it with his paw which then gets stuck there, thinking, I'll free my paw. He grabs it with his other paw. That too gets stuck, 
thinking, I'll free both of my paws. He grabs it with his foot. That too gets stuck. Thinking, I'll free both of my paws and my foot. He grabs it with his other foot. That too gets stuck. Thinking, I'll free both of my paws and my feet as well. He grabs it with his mouth. That too gets stuck. So the monkey, snared in five ways, lies there whimpering, having fallen on misfortune, fallen on ruin, a prey to whatever the hunter wants to do with him. Then the hunter, without releasing the monkey, skewers him right there, picks him up and goes off as he likes. This is what happens to anyone who wanders into what is not his proper range and is the territory of others. For this reason, you should not wander into what is not your proper range and is the territory of others. In one who wanders into what is not his proper range and is the territory of others, Mara gains an opening, Mara gains a foothold. And what for a monk is not his proper range and is the territory of others? The five strings of sensuality. Which five? Forms cognizable by the eye, agreeable, pleasing, charming, endearing, enticing, linked with sensual desire. Sounds cognizable by the ear, aromas cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tactile sensations cognizable by the body, agreeable, pleasing, charming, endearing, enticing, linked with sensual desire. These for a monk are not his proper range and are the territory of others. Wander monks in what is your proper range, your own ancestral territory. In one who wanders in what is his proper range, his own ancestral territory, Mara gains no opening, Mara gains no foothold. And what for a monk is his proper range, his own ancestral territory, the four establishings of mindfulness. Which four? There is a case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on feelings in and of themselves, mind in and of itself, mental qualities in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. This for a monk is his proper range, his own ancestral territory. Any comments, reflections, questions? Monks, whatever is not yours, let go of it. Your letting go of it will be for your long-term happiness and benefit. And what is not yours? The eye is not yours. Let go of it. Your letting go of it will be for your long-term happiness and benefit. Forms are not yours. Eye consciousness is not yours. Eye contact is not yours. Whatever arises in dependence on eye contact, experienced either as pleasure or as pain, or as neither pleasure nor pain, that too is not yours. Let go of it. Your letting go of it will be for your long-term happiness and benefit. The ear is not yours. Let go of it. The nose is not yours. Let go of it. The tongue is not yours. Let go of it. The body is not yours. Let go of it. The intellect is not yours. Let go of it. Your letting go of it will be for your long-term happiness and benefit. Ideas are not yours. Intellect consciousness is not yours. Intellect contact is not yours. Whatever arises in dependence on intellect contact, experiences either as pleasure, as pain, or as neither pleasure nor pain, that too is not yours. Let go of it. Your letting go of it will be for your long-term happiness and benefit. Suppose a person were to gather or burn or do as he likes with the grass, twigs, branches, and leaves here in Jeta's Grove. Would the thought occur to you? It's us that this person is gathering, 
burning or doing with as he likes? No, Lord. Why is that? Because those things are not ourself, nor do they pertain to ourself. In the same way, monks, the eye is not yours. Let go of it. Your letting go of it will be for your long-term happiness and benefit. The ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the intellect is not yours. Let go of it. Your letting go of it will be for your long-term happiness and benefit. Whatever arises in dependence on intellect contact, experience as either, either as pleasure, as pain, or as neither pleasure nor pain, that too is not yours. Let go of it. Your letting go of it will be for your long-term happiness and benefit. Any questions, comments, reflections? Almost exactly the same parallel for the, the one that comes. Mm-hmm. Almost word for word, except changing the six sense spaces. Mm-hmm. There's those different flavors of Mara in here, also. Like there's some Kara Mara, and there's like Mara the Dates. Is there a Mara the Senses and a Mara the Comedy? Is there is that? Because he clears that reference to Mara, like Mara's territory. Well, the, I know that in here it says, oftentimes it says like if, you, if you're going out into the senses, then you sort of come under Mara's sway. Yeah. That consistently comes up under Mara's power. I guess it's just wondering if there's a power. No, I don't, that I don't know. Mm-hmm. <coughs> explicit, explicit as in those others that you were talking about, but more implicit from this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like how in this sutta it says, um, Buddha's explicitly remind us that it's for our long-term happiness benefit. The, like, the English translation, like Indriya Sangwara, is often translated as sense restraint, but I think in America, restraint has negative connotations. Um, so it's other translations are like sense composure or taking care of the senses. I was just thinking that it had a pretty, uh, actually in the, the suits about the central string, it had a very interesting image of, uh, you know, the, uh, like the chariot with the really good horses, mm-hmm. and a skilled driver. Mm-hmm. I was wondering, that seems kind of, it was very interesting, but it wasn't like what I would, I, I, maybe I don't see how it fits together, or, hmm. as he's saying, the central string is like that, uh, you know, great vehicle, you get you to awaken it. Yeah, and some control. Mostly we are in control. Right. Yeah, it's a well trained, well disciplined horse Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to drive the chariot. It's not taking off. You can only get on. Yeah, and especially in ancient India, there was a horse culture. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge uh, premium based on. That was like the computer of its day. It was the yeah. oldest technology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like being really like well trained and uh, yeah, can really do what you want. Yeah. So it's a random happenstance. Something good happens. And I can see if, if one part of the other, I think have any um, thoughts on encouraging ourselves in India Sanwara or censorship? Yes. Any? <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, just do it. Just Try it. it. The default option is so often distracting. Sense of composure without clamping down. I think it's getting that balance. Again, there's that, that long, long-term welfare and happiness to really realize. It just feels a whole lot better to be um, having that sense of composure and steady solidity within oneself. I was going to say that the, it's just interesting just to 
keep coming back to that sense that people have of sense of shame is meaning like, well, if I just don't like, if I just keep my eyes down and look at things, close my eyes as much as possible, try not to hear things, and then don't taste anything pleasant and smell anything, you know, it's not, it's like in parts that you don't close down the senses, it's how you pay attention to the senses, you know, and, and so it's like yoni so much Christ kind of how you actually look your wise examination of what you're seeing. So if you see someone beautiful, then you go out to that and you start, you just start uh, with lust and craving and, and go towards that object and you're looking at that object to fulfill that lust and craving. But sense restraint would be saying like, you know, like, well, is that, is that appropriate? And like, so you're, you're measuring that, that feeling, so you already caught that lust and craving and then you're looking at the object in a very different way so that you're not unrestrained in how you're essentially, you know, absorbing into it so that you would see like, you know, qualities of, of something that you see as beautiful is actually um, a trick of the mind, something that's not um, actually attractive. It's just that you're only paying attention in that particular way that's, that's creating that craving. So the, the restraint around that is actually you're not just like letting that loose. You're actually trying to bring back a sense of like, what's an appropriate amount of attention to pay to something and how do you pay attention to it so it's not lighting a fire under that, that, uh, that desire and keeping it going. Um, and there's so many ways that we can, we can just balance that out. Um, you know, if you smell really nice food, you know, oh, I can't wait to eat that food. And then it's like, well, then you, you can think about like what it looks like and the people who prepared it and all of the you know, worry and labor and all of the things that came with that or, or where that, you know, how that smell arises and disappears so quickly and, and that thing that you're so attracted to just becomes excrement in a short period of time so that that you only so much you try appropriate attention and just takes care of that sense restraint so much. So it's not like closing down the senses, it's more like they're, they're, that you're paying attention to them but you're not, you're not lighting them up so they're you're pointing at the wrong things. Um, and reflecting on like, the smell of food, how it smells so different before you eat than how right. it smells after you eat. Yeah. <laughs> right, and you, you think, so after you eat it, if you're full, you think, oh, <laughs> you know, you want to get out of the room or light some incense. Right. You know, and it's the same smell. <laughs> I just heard him talk, Amr, I'm talking about Ajahn Shah making a body time to not even look at one end for the whole range retreat. He wasn't even going to look at a single one. And then after the range retreat, the lady told the story, I wasn't there. He, uh, he looks up, sees a woman, and it looks like they hit by lightning. So you had to be like, honest with what was the result of that practice that did. And, like, yeah, and being really truthful with yourself. This is the result. Was it a good result? I have to approach it some other way. Like what you were saying, basically. It's something I was remembering. I listened, heard this in a talk somewhere, but uh, the word Indriya, um, you know, like in, it appears in the teachings in different ways. Like there's the restraint Indriya somewhere, or restraint senses, but then there's like the five spiritual Indriyas, the five spiritual faculties. And I thought it was an interesting uh, reflection. That it's like, because the word Indriya comes from, I think, the guy Indra, uh, sort of like the leader of the leader of, of the gods and uh, it's sort of like what do, what do we choose to to lead us uh, do we want to choose india somewhere you know the, the sense uh, stimulation or do we want to choose like the spiritual faculties to be our leaders so you have your choice of what who do you choose to be your india your leader yeah <laughs> or or uh, my leader. <laughs> or five faculties. Or the five faculties, you know, mindfulness and faith and energy and samadhi and panya. Yeah, it's quite when you think about worldly, this, if you look at advertisements today, they're just so, they're almost funny being, uh, you know, practicing the Buddhist teaching because they're just, they're crazy. You know, just like, how much can you get desire, you know, how much can you increase that in yourself, how much can you chase after it, that's the essence of what you want to do. Um, there's no advertisements for 
reaching or death or sickness. <laughs> Except that they can sell it with their insurance. Anything? Uh, I guess just uh, pause for a little bit. If there's no urgent questions or comments before we dive into proceed with meal setup. I actually had a question about um, sleeping on the right side that was mentioned in the mm -hmm. second mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that? Uh, the Buddha consistently prayed it, and I think peop, um, it's kind of standard practice, and for myself I've also found uh, it's helpful. Like, if you sleep on the left side, I end up with bad dreams, <laughs> which is very practical, and, and it just brings up sleeping on other, in other ways tends to uh, incline towards m more unwholesome states, where sleeping on the right side tends towards uh, more wholesome, um, mindful, alert. What sides are better on? Huh? What sides are better on? Yeah. Yeah. On the right side. I can say that uh, if you've had a meal and you're taking a nap after a meal, you shouldn't sit on the right side. And consistently, that, that's what causes aspiration. So, I think he's talking about at night, your stomach's not full. But, uh, anyway. Also, I've uh, heard that it removes stress from the heart mm. if you're on your right side. <clears throat> and if you're on your left side, that encourages <clears throat> excuse me, um, better digestion. Mm -hmm. On your left side, you say? Left side. Yeah, that's what I just said. Yeah, it's like exactly consistent. Mm. Is it a common Good enough to do it for the meal, but it's, uh, I think it takes about, especially with our size, about seven hours it's in the stomach. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so I get, I'll actually, you know, can, just to test the fact that I can feel it you know, for, for that long after. Any further questions or comments? Okay, let me just pause for one, one minute.